Hello, and welcome to the second of the CDC's annual review events. I'm Nisha Pillay, and I shall be your moderator for the next hour and 15 minutes or so. Today's event focuses on climate action, investing in green growth, in clean and inclusive growth. And here's a short film to get us going. The world has a global blueprint to achieve sustainable development, the SDGs. And that is why CDC invests in support of them. Countries have 10 years to reach these targets. But the United Nations is sounding the alarm bells that there is a huge funding gap of two and a half trillion dollars per annum. And this shortfall comes at a time of the biggest global economic downturn in recent history. This has strengthened CDC's resolve in supporting the many communities and 1,200 companies it invests in right across Africa and South Asia. This means doing the hardest things with the hardest hit people in some of the hardest places in the world always in partnership with them. Over the past year, CDC has committed £1.6 billion in businesses supporting productive employment and decent work for more than 850,000 people. This boosts economic growth in a way which ensures that growth is both clean and inclusive to meet sustainable development goals. So, at the heart of CDC's strategy is empowering women economically. This is critical to ensuring women have the power to control their own lives and in closing the gap to achieve Goal 5 on gender equality. And crucially, in 2019, CDC committed £230 million in climate finance to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase the resilience of communities from the impact of climate change. CDC's investment to help build successful companies has an impact on people and communities that is clear, measurable and transformative. Over the year, these investments have reached 1.84 million farmers, served 93 million customers, and treated more than 12 million patients. The goals are ambitious, but they are achievable if organizations across the private and public sectors join forces. Now, more than ever, champions like CDC are leading and accelerating efforts to achieving the sustainable development goals towards a decade of action on leaving poverty behind. And that's why the mission of the CDC is so important. Let's take a quick look at the agenda for this morning's meeting. We're going to start off with an overview of the CDC's work on climate by Liz Lloyd, Chief Impact Officer. That will be followed up by an introduction to CDC's new climate strategy, which is being launched by Dr. Amalie Amin and also by uh, her colleague, Nicola Mustatia. Um, our our chief guest for this morning, I'm pleased to say, is Damilola Ogunbiyi. She's the Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. I'm going to interview her and then broaden out the discussion into a panel discussion and then broaden it out still further to include questions from all of you, wherever you may be joining us from. Whatever your interest in this subject, please do feel free to send in your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. And I'm glad to say that some of you have already started doing so, so keep it up. So now I'm gonna hand over without further ado to Liz Lloyd. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, 2019 was an important mm. year for climate action at CDC. As a DFI investing in Africa and South Asia, we and our investees are acutely aware of the need for sustainable development that takes full account of the impacts of climate change. And we as an institution are committed to play our part in achieving alignment with the Paris Agreement, recognizing the scale and urgency of the challenge. Next slide, please. CDC invested over 230 million pounds in climate finance, 
up from £188 million in 2018. Some examples of the investments include wind farms in Pakistan, uh, metal solar, which is an uh, equity investment in metal by Gridworks, the company was set up and funded by CDC last year to invest in critical power infrastructure. We also have a debt facility from our energy access and efficiency team that specializes in lending for decentralized energy and resource efficiency solutions. These will allow a quicker uptake of cleaner and cheaper sources of electricity for businesses across Africa, in addition to the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions from solar generation. Electricity costs for businesses can be significantly reduced, sometimes up to 40%. Could I have the next slide, please? We also work with our investees for inc increasing climate action. Um, one example is building solutions for a net zero future, supporting 14 trees in the production, promotion and sale of durabrick, their alternative to clay burnt brick in Malawi. By avoiding the firing phase, durabrick reduces greenhouse gas emissions and avoids deforestation, saving on carbon dioxide and offering better resilience to water with higher strength and sustainability all using local materials. As a DFI who is always focused on jobs, ensuring and enabling a just transition is another one of our themes. We've worked with a company called Ayana in India and DFID to train and develop and equip people with the skills for the future. And finally, we work with uh, our investees on adaptation and resilience. Next slide, please. Finally, during 2019, CDC demonstrated its commitment to climate action by signing up to the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures and re refreshing and updating our climate change strategy. This was a process where we took a firm wide approach, starting with our ambition and then working through with our sector strategies, our product MDs, the CIO to ensure it was fully and truly institutionalized. The executive committee, the board and our shareholder were fully part of the process and were spurred on by the huge engagement of our colleagues. Next slide, please. The key elements of our approach are net zero by 2050, just transition and a building block of adaptation and resilience, all highly relevant to our mission, to our objectives, and consistent with the Paris Agreement and the science around, or from the IPCC. We are now turning to a film which will describe the WIND project in Pakistan, after which my colleagues Amaldi Amin, the climate change director, who were delighted joined us earlier this year, and Nicola Mustatea, climate change manager, without whom we would not have our comprehensive strategy today, to take us through the refreshed, refreshed approach. Thank you. I've been working for the last number of years in introducing renewable energy technologies in developing countries. I have completed the development and integration of 50 megawatt wind power project in Pakistan. My relationship with CDC goes back to 2014 when myself and uh, my father Zia Khalili were reaching out for fundraising for the wind power project. It's been a very long and patient relationship that CDC has had with the development team. CDC involvement has been uh, very constructive for my team. Uh, Zephyr itself is a very small team uh, of about 10 people and we've been responsible for uh, the development of the project. As a team, the core team has benefited from the direct interactions uh, with both the equity side of CDC, the debt side of CDC, environment and social governance side. Part of the obligation of a DFI, I firmly believe, is not to only provide capital liquidity, but also to provide intellectual uh, support and uh, training uh, for those people that work within uh, the investi organizations. Good morning, everyone. Delighted to be here to launch our strategy today, which uh, I'll give a very brief overview and then hand over to Nicola 
uh, who can provide a lot more detail on the details of the specific uh, building blocks of the strategy. So just very briefly, uh, I mean, Liz highlighted the um, activities in 2019, but on, on this uh, slide, you can see how the climate agenda has been evolving at CDC over the last few years. So the first climate policy was in 2014, uh, which made a commitment to look at climate change uh, and consider it in, in uh, different investments. Uh, different policies have been implemented over that time frame. CDC um, adopts, adopted the IFC performance standards. And uh, last year, we uh, signed up to the UN Principle for Responsible Investor Statement uh, in support of a just transition to climate change. You also heard that we uh, signed up to the Task Force on Climate Related Disclosure last year, and, and that has been a really important element in developing the new climate strategy. So moving on to the next slide. As you will see here, the climate strategy has taken the TCFD uh, and the four pillars of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure um, as the emerging uh, best practice framework for integrating climate change, both climate risks as well as opportunities within the financial, uh, within the management systems of financial institutions and businesses. And so under these four pillars, we've been working to take forward key uh, activities to ensure uh, we address climate change. In, you'll hear more from Nicola about the strategy uh, which sets out how we invest and, in, and what we will invest in to deliver on our climate objectives. But also, equally important, the, under the TCFD and uh, activities that have begun, begun last year and are continuing, we're starting to look at climate change across the governance framework, so uh, how the board, management, uh, and importantly the investment process and portfolio management process consider climate change. Uh, looking at risk management, uh, as many I think uh, will be aware, climate risk is a growing risk. Uh, this is both uh, considered in terms of the physical impacts of climate change, as well as the transition risk. And so we've started to integrate uh, climate risk into our financial risk management process. And last but not least, metrics. Uh, we, of course, will need to report on how we're delivering on this strategy in terms of uh, emissions across the portfolio and climate finance, uh, how we're delivering across different sectors. And so we're also working with others, many other partners, uh, around uh, identifying the best practice metrics to apply. Next slide, please. And just unpacking that a little bit more, uh, as you can see, we have two main objectives of our new strategy. One is to take responsibility for climate change, both in terms of the impact across our whole portfolio, as well as to pursue new opportunities across all sectors. And this uh, has a focus, of course, on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, ensuring we become uh, on a pathway to be net zero emissions by 2050, and very importantly, ensuring the resiliency of our investments and our investees, as well as how we can invest more to help contribute towards countries and sectors and communities' um, uh, adaptation and resiliency needs. As well, we uh, are integrating into how we operate. So uh, as mentioned on the previous slide, um, we've started to integrate climate into the governance uh, process, um, looking at the risk management, taking a forward-looking approach, as well as the approach towards metrics. And on the next slide, you will see uh, how uh, these uh, various um, activities are being taken forward. So you can see that uh, it's very much work in progress. The strategy uh, sets out um, uh, ambitions at the institutional level as well as the sector level. Uh, and you'll hear from Nicola in a minute uh, how we're moving forward to to um, identify the pathway to get to net zero by 2050, as well as the approach we're taking around just transition 
and on adaptation and resilience. Very importantly, I think it's, it's worth just highlighting how we're taking both a portfolio-wide approach towards climate change, as well as taking a more country aligned approach. And we see both those as equally important is in determining our investment strategy and integrating that into our investment processes moving forward. So I'm now delighted to hand over to Nicola, who will go into more detail on some of the key issues already highlighted. Thank you very much, Amalie, and, and good morning, everybody. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the starting point for us as a development finance institution was how we actually can support the economic transformation in our markets in Africa and South, South Asia to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 and doing this in a manner that is socially just, that delivers on people's needs for prosperity and improved living standards. And you've heard from Amalie and Liz already that our Paris alignment approach is based on these three building blocks of net zero by 2050, supporting a just transition and doing more on adaptation and resilience. Next slide, please. So why the importance of the building block of net zero by 2050 for CDC as an institution? This is driven both by our mandate, but also the types of instruments we deploy to achieve development impact. It's worth noting here that many of the markets we invest in, in Africa and South Asia themselves set out an ambition to achieve net zero and resilient economies by 2050. So that's really core to our mandate. Secondly, in order to achieve development impact, we um, deploy investment products. So it's also really important to note here that many private sector investors and businesses have set out ambitions towards Paris alignment and net zero by 2050. For example, a range of asset owners committing to net zero emissions portfolio by 2050. Next slide, please. Amalie already referred to our dual approach um, on net zero by 2050. First, we set out an ambition for our portfolio to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And this is complemented by assessing individual transactions for their individual alignment with a country's pathway to net zero emissions by 2050. Starting on the right hand side with the portfolio level approach, we feel that this approach is really useful to drive decarbonization and emission reductions across all sectoral investments we make, given the need um, to decarbonize all sectors as we build net zero economies. Crucially, a portfolio approach also incentivizes investments in, in projects with negative emissions, for example, um, forestry. However, we feel that a portfolio level approach on its own is not sufficient. And that is um, due to the fact that it can have unintended consequences. First, a portfolio level approach on its own can potentially lead to a focus on decarbonizing the portfolio through exits. And secondly, it can have other unintended consequences if a project with negative climate impact in one country is supported as long as it's balanced by a climate positive project in another country. So in order to avoid this, we complement our portfolio approach by assessing individual transactions for their alignment with a country's own pathway to net zero emissions by 2050. So how does this look like in practice? Next slide, please. Starting again with the portfolio level, um, we are currently baselining our portfolio emissions. And based on that, we will develop a carbon budget methodology and a roadmap um, for our investments and our portfolio to reach net zero emissions by 2050. At a transaction level, which is what you see here, we're categorizing investments either as misaligned, conditionally aligned, or aligned with the Paris Agreement. Starting on the right-hand side, on the aligned side, um, we will increase our investment activity in green and climate sectors. So in those sectors that are clearly aligned with the Paris Agreement. And for next year in 2021, we set an ambitious target of 30% of our annual commitments to be in climate related sectors. Then again, on the misaligned side to the left side of the spectrum, here crucially, we will not make any new commitments either directly or for new commitments into funds in sectors that we have deemed as misaligned with the Paris Agreement based on research by the World Resources Institute. And that includes a range of sectors ranging from 
uh, coal-fired power plants to coal processing, mining and trading to upstream oil exploration and production, midstream oil, including refineries, heavy fuel oil only fired power plants and mini grids, as well as upstream gas exploration and production and certain types of transport infrastructure. But crucially, there are many sectors that fall in between the aligned and the misaligned categorization. So these are those sectors that can play a role in the transition to net zero economies in certain, but not all circumstances. And for those, we are developing further guidance to assess the alignment of these investments with a country's pathway to net zero emissions by 2050. And again, very importantly, we think that this means a shift in thinking on how we think about climate into these, in these investments. In many previous climate assessments, there was a strong focus on relative emissions. So that means uh, looking at the incremental change, for example, from a higher carbon source to a lower carbon source. And even though we feel that this remains a critical and very necessary factor uh, for climate assessments, it's not sufficient for Paris alignment. We think Paris alignment is about taking into account the absolute emissions profile of an investment and assessing its alignment with a country's pathway. And on that basis, we will only pursue uh, investments in gas power or gas midstream projects if they fulfill our requirements of our emerging guidance of assessing the absolute emissions alignment with a country's pathway to net zero. And we feel that this approach really helps us to deliver our development and climate impact in a coherent manner. Next slide, please. The, just, just the transition to net zero will have mean profound changes for people, uh, businesses, economies and communities. And that's why we made the Just Transition Agenda a core part to our Paris alignment approach to really make sure that decent and green jobs and skills development remains very core to how we um, make investments. We started to identify green skills needs across our priority sectors and will start developing targeted initiatives um, to address those. Liz already mentioned um, our skills development program we jointly run with DFID with our investment company Ayana, which we established in India, where we worked on a widespread skilling program on infrastructure skills for people to take advantage of the new jobs in the renewable energy sector. And very crucially, in all of our just transition interventions, we will take into account gender considerations to really make sure the just transition is also an inclusive transition for women in particular. Next slide, please. Moving to the last building block of our Paris alignment approach, adaptation and resilient. Despite all efforts um, to move towards net zero economies, the effects of climate change are already acutely felt by people in Africa and South Asia in particular ranging from heat waves to cyclones to floods and droughts. And chronic changes in temperatures and sea level rise will mean that more needs to be done to address those climate impacts of today and those more that are to come in the years to come. So our approach to adaptation and resilience will work on two levels. Firstly, we will continue to work with portfolio companies as we have done before to help identify climate related risks of today and tomorrow and think about implementing solutions to adapt and become more resilient. We will also do more to develop a systematic tool for climate risk assessment across our investments, particularly in the sectors of food and agriculture, construction and real estate and infrastructure as those sectors that are particularly exposed. And then secondly, as part of our adaptation and resilience approach, we will target more proactively businesses and projects that provide products and services that help others, other businesses, other people and communities to adapt and become more resilient to climate change. We think that this climate change strategy and Paris alignment will set us up really well to actually support countries in Africa and South Asia um, to become more green and resilient and inclusive as they recover from the current crisis by actually making sure that climate change will be at the heart of every investment we make. 
thank you. Back to Nisha. Nicola, thank you so very much. Uh, Amali will be joining us again a little bit later on to take some of your questions. They've already been coming in thick and fast, so be prepared, Amali. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our special guest, Damilola Ogun B. She is the special representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. She's also co-chair of the UN Energy Commission, and she runs the whole Sustainable Energy for All directorate. It's a huge mission. Um, what can I say? Dami Lola, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Now, I want you to tell us a little bit about how you see your priorities. When you came to step into this big job in January, you brought with you the experience of a practitioner, right? Delivering electricity, delivering power across Nigeria to places, very remote villages which weren't connected. So what do you see as the key things that you want to achieve, that you want the directorate to achieve? I mean, universal access is always key. Um, with the latest figures showing that 789 million people still don't have um, access to basic electricity is, is shocking, and that's one of the key things. And then kind of a bit wider is the access to clean cooking as well. We still have, at least in Africa, 900 million people not having access to clean cooking. And clean cooking has so many effects on women, gender-based violence, and all these other heinous crimes. So, so those, were, those were my key priorities. With that, you can't really leave out the renewable story. The energy access story is really a renewable story. Um, and also energy efficiency as well. So my key focus was to um, achieve SDG 7 and just show the opportunities that, you know, Africa and Southeast Asia have to kind of, you know, really, really get by doing that. It's a huge, huge job. And the numbers are, are mind boggling that there are still so many people without clean cooking fuels and, and without access to energy. I saw an interview you did, Damilola, uh, in January, I think, in which you said the next two years, 2020 and 2021, will be absolutely critical to making sure that we get to the 2030 objective. But then we went slap bang into the COVID crisis. So what has been the short term impact in terms of trying to achieve SE for all? I mean, the impact on projects and implementation are clear and just being able to not be able to physically move around. But the other impact is that it's left one of the most vulnerable populations that did have access. Some of them just don't have money to pay for, for electricity. So a lot of the off-grid developers and the utilities, I mean, you can't really have a conversation about access and not include the African utilities. Um, you know, have been affected for this. But on the positive note, I think it has brought the climate and energy conversation um, a lot closer. This, this, this notion of just transition, what exactly does it mean? Because there's energy for energy access, but there's also energy for economic growth and industrialization. And I think sometimes that's mixed up. I mean, I think it's allowed us to really work on the plans. And, and to be honest, I think it's allowed us to kind of reset, right? What does it mean now? that we are in this economic crisis, how do we reset with sustainable energy for all? And, and you know, how do we utilize it to the, to the best of the country's advantages? So you're seeing, saying that despite the short term impact, which has been very onerous, you think that longer term, there may, might be more positive benefits coming out, um, the overlap I mean, between the climate action and the pandemic responses. I mean, definitely. I mean, I feel like um, because of this crisis, there's a lot more attention on why the climate community and the energy community do have to come together. And organizations like CDC that are looking at, you know, both, both dimensions and plan with the actual countries. I mean, I think it's the first time I've seen since my working career, countries actually calling up saying, we do want to recover better. How do we recover better? And what is our transitional path? And, you know, it's not as easy to say just renewables or just fossil. It's actually a mixture of, of both to get, to get countries back on their feet, but more importantly, um, you know, creating additional GDP and jobs. So th there's a lot of work and planning to do, which is hopefully what everyone's doing now. So we're here at the launch of the CDC's new climate action strategy. How do you see the CDC being best able to contribute to a, a just transition in Africa? I mean, I'm really encouraged by the strategy. I mean, we were given the opportunity, thank you, to actually review it 
um, before it was finalized. And I think that's also important to get as, you know, as many people, you know, thinking and adding to the strategy. Um, I, I think what is the key thing that CDC has to do, and I'm sure they're already doing, is talking to governments about how they reach that 2050 target, right? Um, because it's, it's a very, very important question, as, as, uh, at least how it, it's framed with energy with Africa. I'm not sure you can talk about energy transition in Africa, and it's just a renewable story. Gas does play a role, not just in electrification, but also in clean cooking, but it plays a role as a transition. And, and helping them guide them to show them, you know, within X amount of decades, you need to transition into renewable. I think it's key. And that's what I would, you know, literally encourage CDC to do and keep on doing. That's an increasingly hotly debated topic, isn't it? And I think we're already receiving some questions on it. But can I just ask you, while we were talking about just transition, to make it a bit more tangible for us? I mean, from a Nigerian perspective, from an on-the-ground perspective, what does it even mean, just transition? Again, it's, it's something that everyone has to actually define, and it's different for every country. But right now, you're working with an economy which is filled with basically very, very dirty fuels you know, a diesel and petrol driven economy. And, you know, just transition for a Nigerian case will probably have a mixture, a hybrid of solar, increasingly a lot more renewables. Really happy to see that Nigeria included 5 million solar connections in their economic sustainability post COVID plan. And then we move on to a part where we can finally say we're being powered by renewables. It's not really different for the UK or any other countries, right? We don't have that, um, or I haven't seen yet examples of um, countries that have actually industrialized just on renewables. So there's a pathway to economic growth that you can't leave out when you're having these conversations. Um, but you have to try as much as possible to put renewables first and to always have renewables in the mix. And how do you see the role for the private sector, investors like the CDC, in trying to, to lead the response for a green stimulus? I mean, in terms of at least, let's say, the African and the, the South Asian sense, you know, investing in renewables is still key. I mean, like I said, there's still 789 million people that don't have access. Africa alone is 565 million. We know that that household access can actually be solved by renewables. So mini grid, solar home systems, connecting um, larger scale plants to the grids. Um, the role of utility is also really key in this. Investment in um, enhancing the utilities, the distribution networks, the, you know, the transmission networks. I think there's, there's huge opportunities um, that actually come out of this. The other piece of work we've been working as well is the supply chain. Um, there's been a lot of disruption to supply chain, and that's really because if anybody wants to buy 20 solar panels, they go to China. So there is that responsibility to have, and I'm hoping Nigeria would be that case, at least large-scale assembly of panels, inverters, lithium batteries in con country or in continent. So it's easily accessible for the rest of the continent and, and hopefully reduces the cost of actually doing um, solar hybrid projects. Okay, so I'm going to broaden this discussion out in a minute, Damilola, to bring in our panelists. So first, can I just ask you, what do you want to see CDC doing more of and, and less of, you know, in the next decade? I mean, I don't know about less of. Um, more of is a lot more investment in, 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 in smaller scale renewables is key, but also helping governments plan what a just transition to actually look like. So investment in the technical assistance is really, really critical for governments to, um, to move ahead and move past fossil into renewables and to show them that trajectory and trying to influence that to go into their um, NDCs as well by the time we have COP, which is a, you know, a UK COP, um, would be great. Great. So Damilola, thank you for your time to getting this conversation going. Stay with us. I'm going to now mm -hmm. introduce our other panelists. Um, and the first person I'm going to introduce you to is Kumail Khalili, the CEO of Zephyr Power. You saw him in that short video that we played earlier um, with the help of CDC, Zephyr Power is now up and running. Kumail Khalili, welcome. Thank you. We also have, Pleasure being here. Uh, we have, and he's based in Pakistan. Um, MD and head of Asia for CDC based in Bangalore is Srini Nagarajan. Srini, are you with us? Please come in. 
waiting to connect with Srini. We also have Amali Amin, as you know, who introduced the strategy, um, the new climate action strategy, and Dami Lola. And hopefully Srini will join us in a minute or two. So I'm going to start off this discussion um, with, with you, uh, Komel, if I may. So you have got a wind power plant up and running now for about a year. Congratulations. You're getting income in, right? My question is this, how competitive is wind power in Pakistan? Uh, wind power, uh, as with uh, other renewable technologies, has become competitive. Uh, over the last uh, three to five years, uh, you've seen significant improvements in technology that tie into the resources that we actually have in Pakistan. Uh, so not only has technology improved, but also there's been a significant reduction in pricing of that technology. Uh, so from where we were three to four years ago, the efficiencies along with pricing have uh, reduction, improvement in efficiencies and reduction in pricing has resulted in significant decrease in the levelized cost of electricity that we see in the marketplace uh, from renewables. Uh, building on that, of course, then there's the leverage structures and the capital structures of the transactions. Uh, and that plays a very important role. And because of these improvements, we've seen uh, transitions from debt structures of 70% to uh, today's projects, which are at about 80% debt, uh, which really allows the tariff to be uh, reduced. Uh, and then also longer tenures of the project really allow the tariff to be reduced. So um, wind, solar technologies are all uh, very competitive in this marketplace and uh, are actually having a material impact on, on our system today. Okay, and the system is one which has a shortage of reliable and affordable power. So where do you see the potential for renewable energy in Pakistan? From a technology standpoint, and I, uh, Damilola, your comments are exactly in line with the challenges that we see in here in Pakistan. Um, the application for off-grid and distributed uh, solar, uh, the application of battery storage technologies for uh, grid stability, uh, essentially offsetting uh, expensive transmission distribution infrastructure. Uh, and then wind, of course, when you're talking about uh, efficiencies on technology, which are starting to approach base uh, traditional generation, uh, you've seen 50% increases in the efficiency of technology. So it's, uh, there's, material, uh, there's material change to happen in the marketplace, but uh, that's from a technology stand standpoint. A lot of other things uh, have to happen for that technology to be implemented. Great. Um, so let's meet Srini Nagarajan now. I think you're uh, with Nisha. us from Bangalore. Great to have you with us. Yeah, thank I don't know you. If we we're able to hear um, what Komal said just there, but I think yeah. that Zephyr Power is just the first of many such projects you have lined up for Pakistan and South Asia. Give us the overall picture. What is the, your ambition, the scale of your ambition in South Asia? Thank you, Nisha. I'm sorry for the video interruption. So I must say that CDC is committed to reducing the impact of climate change as a part of our effort to achieve environmentally sustainable economic growth. What happens in South Asia will clearly have a profound impact since the countries in the region are A, growing rapidly. It's very densely populated. I'll give you some numbers later. Uh, are extremely vulnerable to climate impact. So bearing the brunt of this is 600 million people, poor people in the region who depend on climate sensitive sectors within the region. So it's got a profound impact every day morning and get up. It has a pr profound impact in everyone's life, including me. So we are looking to support renewable energy generation across our markets, whatever, so wherever there is ample natural resources available, solar radiation, uh, windy sites, and, they, and of course the regulatory framework, which work, works much better for her. Uh, for us. We have investments in Zephyr in Pakistan, Ayana in India, a hydro project in Nepal. All, uh, all of that will aggregate today to around 1.2 billion, sorry, 1.2 gigawatt. And we continue to actively look at opportunities. In Pakistan, in addition, we have supported three wind opportunities, which add up to 150 megawatts of capacity. 
And definitely we are looking at uh, more and more active solar and wind energy opportunities within the region. The, I think in, in terms of objectives there is to bring down the cost of energy for the country while also reducing the reliance on imported fuel and most importantly, carbon emissions. So across the region, I would say that we have already supported new capacity generation of around one gigawatt per annum. And we expect to remain uh, at or increase the space over, over the coming years. And Pakistan will be a very meaningful amount of this along with the other markets in, in South Asia. Okay, so you've been talking about renewable power in South Asia, but that's only one piece of the decarbonization process, isn't it? What about um, electrical vehicles, uh, green homes, the circular economy? Are you, have you got plans in those areas? Sure. Besides supporting the, uh, the, the development of utility scale renewable energy generation, we will also look at decentralized renewable energy solutions such as uh, solar home systems, mini grids, commercial and industrial, uh, you, know, in, uh, you know, solar solutions, and um, definitely energy storage, and ensure that energy efficiency is a cross-cutting theme for all relevant sectors, which in the six sectors we focus on, like green buildings, mobility, charging stations, et cetera. Clearly one area which will be a shift from is the IC engines to electric, and that would mean investments in both the OEMs and certainly supporting infrastructure, predominantly the charging stations as we're talking about. So similarly, as we increase renewable energy generation, there is definitely a need to strengthen the grid and, and make it more intelligent. And this will lead to investments in definitely smart grid solutions, really. The transmission and distribution losses in the state electricity board across India and many other geographies we operate in is tremendously high, leading to a lot of losses for those SEBs. And these smart grid solutions, especially in terms of the, the, the overall, overall distribution framework, uh, will help us a lot in this. So, Amali, can I bring you in for a CDC higher level comment on this now with from the point of view of the strategy? Clearly, there's a quite a complicated program of investments being explored and lined up in South Asia, similarly in Africa. But what about this contentious subject of your current fossil fuel portfolio? We've had a few questions coming in on the Q&A, which I think I should just get, it, get them out into the space. When are you likely to start disinvesting from coal? So I think, as, as Nicholas said, set out, um, we have uh, got a number of exclusions moving forward. In fact, actually coal, we haven't been investing in coal uh, for many years. Uh, that had been excluded for some time. Um, I think you know the question that was raised uh, in that I saw in the in the in the chat uh, was will we start to divest? Um, I think you know it's really important to ensure that we have you know a smooth exit from any investments. Um, you know it's the potential negative development impacts that could have need to be avoided, and and of course it just offloads the 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 issue onto someone else. Uh, also, very importantly, through our ESG teams, uh, we work with fossil fuel companies to enable um, the transition and uh, to ensure a good, smooth exit. And in fact, are starting to look at some um, investees, how we can help them think through this issue of a just transition, uh, how to enable workers and communities that may be reliant on uh, fossil fuel uh, sectors, how they can move uh, into cleaner, greener uh, types of uh, jobs and other economic activities. So uh, we we aren't going to take a quick divestment approach, but of course, uh, in line with our uh, transition to be net zero by 2050, we increasingly will need to manage um, those uh, the transition issues, both uh, in terms of investing in newer uh, cleaner technologies, as well as how we manage any uh, transition away from fossil fuels. So, but we don't do coal. We haven't done coal for many years uh, in any case. So. so, accelerating that divestment is clearly a process that has to be managed and will be a priority over the next exactly. few years you at CDC. Um, well, let's look at something more positive, which is the investment in, in new renewable power and the importance of off-grid solutions. Damilola, mm -hmm. I know this is a subject very close to your heart. Can you tell us about the balance you think that needs to be struck between off-grid and on-grid in Africa to make sure that you actually meet your uh, sustainable energy for all ambitions for 2030? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it it goes back to the planning and the and the information that's available. The first, the way you can strike a balance is understanding what the least cost electrification cost is for any community at any time. And some of it would be utility, would be on grid, and some of it would be off grid. And even in the off grid rate space, recognizing are people better served with mini grids or they can they be served with solar home systems? So for me, it really starts with the planning. And I think every country, if they don't have it already, because a lot of people don't, I mean, what CDC can do and the British government has been helping, at least different in Nigeria, helped us present what is an integrated energy plan. And our integrated energy plan included on and off grid. So we could see clearly what was the viable places for off grid developers and they could start doing that. And we could see clearly what on grid. What we also found out, which we didn't know we would find, is commercially viable mini grids that didn't need any forms of subsidy as well. So, I mean, I, I really think, it, you know, sorry. Tantalizing thing you were just saying, sorry to interrupt. Commercially viable mini grids. So tell me about what your experience has been in seeing the role for the private sector, the extent to which we can, we can try and expand private sector investment without necessarily um, government support and uh, DFI support. Again, it goes back to the data and planning. If you give private sector enough good data and information on you know, where the communities are, what's the affordability to play ratio, allow them to set tariffs in terms of willing buyer, willing seller, and have the regulation to drive a private sector growth, that's what you would get. The off-grid story is a private sector driven story. Um, that's what's worked and that is what's still working. It's almost like the IPP model back in the day in terms of the catchment areas. Well, we're just saying that this now has to be a renewable story. So I'm really, really excited about that. I'm also excited about the supply, supply chain opportunities opportunities and it's all because it's not necessarily putting climate first which it should be but it's also listening to governments and saying okay what do they want to see they want to see jobs and they also want to see gdp why don't you make those jobs green jobs and why don't you make it actually a green recovery and you know i am very very pleased to say a lot of governments have absorbed that now now they need the funding the expertise the private sector to come in and actually execute this in in the countries I think that's a message that Gumail Khalili is going to echo very strongly, the importance of the economic growth side of the equation. Gumail, I was really uh, intrigued to see that Zephyr Wind Park is also doing some kind of mangrove rehabilitation work at its site. What's that about? What, what, what are you trying to achieve there? Uh, Zephyr actually is uh, in the Indus Delta, uh, which has a, a substantial mangrove population. And uh, we have been working with the local community, local government, um, and the, the forestry department to, uh, to recover uh, the mangroves in the area. Uh, the local community is highly dependent on uh, fishing, crabbing, shrimp farming uh, within our site and in proximity to our site. So uh, in our effort to enable the local community and local businesses, uh, we focused on developing and protecting our resources on the site. Um, and we're seeing very good results of it uh, with regards to uh, increased uh, wildlife on the site and increased activity from the local community. Uh, mangroves also um, are protecting the asset, uh, which are very good, they're very good for uh, protecting the shoreline and protecting erosion and saltwater incursion on the site. So it's protecting the asset, but it's also enabling local communities. Ah, so it works both ways. Uh, that's a win-win. So Amalie, we were hearing from Nicola earlier about the importance of uh, these adaptation projects, like the kind of thing Gomel has been talking to us about building resilience. Is that going to be something that you're going to do more of then in the next 10 years as part of your you know, 30% investment into climate action um, projects? Yeah, I mean, we have to do a lot more. We know, I think as Srini said um, in his uh, initial intervention, um, our, our countries, our, our, you know, our markets where we work are already feeling the impacts of climate change. I mean, we saw some, you know, very extreme temperatures uh, in Pakistan and India this uh, only a few months ago, um, which can make certain 
act economic activities um, you know just not viable in the future unless we invest more in the types of uh, business solutions and um, uh, services that can provide uh, what we refer to as adaptation and resilience. Um, I mean, Kamal's example um, in the Zephyr uh, wind farm and the mangroves is, you know, extremely good example uh, of how uh, we have done this and certainly will need to do more when, particularly when focusing on infrastructure that are long lived assets, uh, you know, because the climate, uh, you know, the climate uh, impacts uh, are still quite uncertain as well. You know, we don't yet know what temperature rise we're headed towards. I mean, of course, we're committed to staying well below two degrees and 1.5 degrees uh, as needed to avoid the most catastrophic levels of climate change. Um, but from a risk management perspective, uh, we need to think ahead and, and understand what the climate models, what the science is telling us, the different impacts may be uh, and we need to take those down to different uh, regions and even very local contexts because uh, I think that's one of the other challenges is how how understanding how climate impacts will uh, affect particular areas and particular activities and being able to apply uh, better data better analysis of that data is going to be absolutely essential to understanding potential climate impacts in the coming decades yeah you know listening to you amelie reminds me of something my father's always telling me which is the climate crisis is not something over there nisha we're living it right now in india and srini can i just pull you in to to uh, expand on that thought, you know, what, in, from what you see on the ground, how does the warming, the overheating climate affect people's lives in South Asia? Um, I mean, I must say, I was reading an article this morning, Nisha, where they're saying that because of COVID-19, we are, we are reversing the ban on single-use plastic, right? I mean, this is just a news item as of today morning. So uh, this is probably the genesis of what we are going through in this particular. So, I mean, I was reading a recent you know, report from the Ministry of Earth Sciences in India, which saying that the average temperature in India has increased by 0.7 degrees Celsius, but in 1901 to 2018, that is purely due to the greenhouse emission gases, really. It also states that in a best case scenario, India's temperature will still rise by 2.7 degrees by 2099, Worst case, 4.4. If I may just give you a little bit of statistics about Pakistan and Bangladesh, the average mean temperature in Pakistan has increased by roughly 0.5 degrees centigrade. The number of heat waves in the country has increased fivefold in the last 30 years. Bangladesh, 0.7 million Bangladeshis are displaced due to natural catastrophe. And as a result of which, they now move into the main city, Dhaka, which has become more densely populated of 2,700 people per square, kilometer, per, per square mile. So by 2050, 13.3 million Bangladeshis will need internal migration to survive against any gruesome impact of climate change. You can imagine these numbers are really beginning to impact our day-to-day -day lives in the country. So it has got a long-term socioeconomic impact on the lives in the people within the continent. It affects, I mean, the aspects of, like you pointed out, the heat stress, air pollution, unpredictable weather events, and unfortunately, the poorest people are the most vulnerable people, and they're also ill-equipped to protect themselves against the effects of these. So there is an increasing cognizance of these issues. However, a lot needs to be done across policy investment and implication, implementation, where I'm very proud that CDC is a part of the journey. So Srini, we've got some questions coming in, which you can all see. There's one here which says uh, the CDC has no sector specialists on the physical side of their investments. How do they ensure their investments are based firmly on the ground and not just at the finance levels? And I think you would be able to give a good response to that. Sure. Uh, certainly, I think, uh, I'll, let, let me talk to you a bit about my IANA experience, if you don't mind. Uh, it's very passionate. I won't go on for too long. It's very passionate to me. Um, as it, it's not the norm of a DFI to start an entity, of a wholly owned entity like this, but CDC is very unique from that perspective. So in 2018, we set up IANA as a wholly owned entity 
we wouldn't set it up unless we had knowledge of the industry of the sector and a very deep insight because to run an entity is very different than investing minority stakes really so we focused on the underserved states of india which is the north and eastern parts of india where there is a power deficit and and a lot more dependency on coal over the last two years the and uh, and uh, the, the platform has managed to at least commit and building around 1.1 gigawatt in a and b states demonstrating that we can build a successful platform, quote, under quote, unquote, highest business integ in, you know, integrity standards in underdeveloped regions in India. One thing I must tell you, Nisha, that it's, it's important as far as aspect of climate change is concerned, scale is very important. If you don't achieve scale, you won't achieve the impact really. So IANA is planning to build around four to five gigawatt over the next three to four years. So as a process and a part of our mobilization team, we have attracted third party investors from the government of India, and also an entity called GGF, which is backed by the light source, which is an associate of GP to bring in more technical knowledge to us really. The last point I just want to mention is, time and again, we have realized that people living closer to the sites, the sites in India, A, don't have electricity, and they are not treated very, very, very well in terms of jobs and skilling. So we set up this skilling center, which Amali pointed out in Andhra Pradesh, along with DFIT support, thanks to them, and we, we, we set up this specialized skill training center with operation and uh, where we focused on women to, to have or to train women. And we trained around 185 candidates of, of which around 85 are women and they could find job opportunities in the upcoming sector. So I think as a result of which we are building an ecosystem in and, in and around our solar site. It's very, it's very difficult to do these things unless you have complete product knowledge. So we do have an incredibly strong team in infrastructure and understanding of power. And I just want to bring Kumail Khalili in at this point. You said in that little video that we showed earlier in the meeting that CDC's involvement has been very constructive. It was quite intriguing because then the interview stopped and you said that that was quite apart from the funding. What did you mean by that? Uh, Zephyr's relationship with CDC actually goes back to 2013. Uh, when we were, when the project was in development and we were looking for a development partner. Uh, an equity partner to come on board. Now, please note Zephyr was actually funded by CDC in 2017. So over a period of four years, uh, CDC's infrastructure team in particular, uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Dreyer, who, uh, who uh, was on the team at the time and uh, remains there, uh, committed to working with a team that had an idea and a vision and an objective of delivering a project in Pakistan. And over those four years, he was a uh, available resource for us to reach out to, to, uh, to pick his mind. Uh, Srini's point is very valid in that the team does have uh, a competence. Um, the, the, Michael is a developer by background where there wasn't a skill set available within the team, we, we were recommended advisors to bring on board. So the, the funding was, the sec, was, a, was an important aspect, but having the development experience and institutional experience to develop a project, and not only from the technical standpoint, but also be involved on the uh, supporting on the regulatory standpoint, and most importantly, uh, on the environmental standpoint, uh, has been critical for the product that we ended up with uh, today, where it considers the environment, it considers the site, and as a result, uh, we've mitigated significant technical, financial, and environmental risk in the system because of this direct invest, uh, involvement that we had across the CDC platform. Okay, I wanted to ask a question to, I'll try to find it on the, on the list. There was something about just transitions and how you're going to work to, to uh, improve worker rights and to improve worker representation. I can't find it on the chat anymore. Um, but is that something that I could put please to Amali? So uh, I think, and you know, I think Srini's given really good example in the case of Ayana, um, I mean, our focus really is to work with our investees and to, alongside that, provide um, the training to help skill, provide necessary skills and upskilling. 
um, as needed uh, and will be increasingly needed uh, for the transition to net zero. So that's really very much our focus. Um, we, we of course would follow, um, you know, under the IFC performance standards, um, would follow all, you know, international best practice around workers' rights and all of that and would, uh, you know, wouldn't uh, be able to invest if those weren't being followed. Um, but our main focus around just transition is to, you know, really help build and generate the necessary um, jobs uh, and human human capital, if you like, alongside uh, the financial uh, capital that we invest. So, you know, I think that's that's really uh, key. I think another aspect, though, is we we will need to start to be, you know, maybe more strategic in how we identify where we see some of those potential um, potentially negative transition issues uh, in our markets. Um, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, some of our investees that, uh, you know, we know that they may be, you know, if they're going to be um, at some point, you know, in, in the next 10, 20, 30 years, we'll be um, shutting down their operations, uh, for example, in fossil fuels, as we've talked about, then how do we work with those companies to ensure that they start to put in place plans that can enable the transition of those workers and also those communities? So it's not just the workers in the actual um, plants, but all those communities that develop around these, you know, these big infrastructure projects and, you know, really important to think around about that and how, you know, look ahead into the future so we can minimize any negative uh, social uh, uh, impacts in the future. Yeah. So talking about um, fossil fuels, here's a question about um, the overlap between COVID-19 and the question mark it potentially holds over gas. Damilola, I'm going to ask you to respond to it because you were sounding very strongly in favor of gas as a transition fuel. The COVID-19 pandemic has very likely accelerated peak demand for fossil fuels, says our questioner. It will take several years for it to rebound. In that time, the growth will be in solar and wind, which is increasingly efficient and competitive, as Kamel was saying. Why should you still put faith in gas? It's not about putting faith in gas. It's just about being realistic. And I think people forget that. Like, and, and, and I would argue with anybody who can show me an African energy transition plan that doesn't mean going from coal to gas to, with, with renewables. So we know renewables are increasingly becoming the cheapest form of energy. We know all of that. But we weak grids, weak utilities, and still the sense of industrialization. It's not fair for Africa to be that guinea pig. Um, and, I, and, I, and I really believe in that. Um, it's taken, you know, even countries like UK still using gas with all the money, um, still using coal. So to just tell another nation to stop doing something is, is hard. And we're saying that don't encourage it. What you have to say is that look at it as part of whatever transition has to happen. But we know the end goal is renewables. Um, and I think even all the documents we bring out, we are very, very forceful about renewables. But again, people need to recognize that Africa wants to industrialize, they want to be competitive, they want economic growth. And, you know, people really need to point out which country to me has done that without some level of fossil. And if we reject it, we might actually go to what we really don't want, which is countries embracing coal. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is just facts now. So um, it's not, it's not a hypothetical thing it's like when you go on ground and you're implementing what do you implement and you have to listen to the countries and i feel like that is a really really key part of what cdc is doing and can do like you know we can work on and, and, and i'm happy to work with cdc on what is the african energy transition plan country by country what does it look like and I think it will show predominantly a renewable story right but you know if someone tells me to choose coal instead of gas of course I'm going to choose gas you know and if someone talks about industrialization or not industrialization it's also important as well so I think there's the hypothetical and there's the realistic and I mean I'm here to just be realistic and tell you um, what countries can do and what countries have you know are focused on and how we can really Proof clean recovery and hybrid solutions moving on. So um, that's my response to that. 
Camilola Ogun be the voice of realism there. And as you mm -hmm. said, um, SE for All and CDC are working together closely in terms of projects that they can do together and the overall framework. Um, I'm going to now uh, put a, two or three questions together in one for Amalie, which are all about Africa. There's one about what's your exposure in Southern Africa. There's another about how do you see CCDC using its role to accelerate the energy mix and, trans and transition in Southern Africa. And there's also a question about plans for North Africa. So can I throw them all to you, please, Amalie? Thank you. Um, so off the top of my head, I'm not exactly sure the exposure in, it was it South Africa or the question or Southern Africa? I mean, we'd have to get back on the exact uh, percentage or, uh, you know, overall um, uh, assets we have there. Um, I think, uh, so in terms of, I mean, I just fully agree with what uh, Damalola said. Um, it's really important that uh, we think through and identify what an energy transition plan means and what it means for individual countries. Um, you know, we see these sort of global models, we see these re regional models. Um, um, there's very little uh, for our countries. Um, I know some countries, I think Nigeria, South Africa, uh, Ethiopia are actually developing um, uh, sort of long-term strategies or long-term pathways that can help identify their pathway to net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, but, you know, we really need much more understanding uh, analysis and data around that, um, for sure. Um, I also, you know, I think um, another point that I just want to flag in that context is, um, you know, I mean, we've talked a lot about the energy sector, and of course that's extremely important. Um, but I think it's really important to also recognize that our climate strategy is actually cuts across all sectors. Uh, it's not an energy strategy, but of course, uh, energy is, um, you know, one of the biggest uh, sectors, most important sectors for economic growth, uh, and also one of the most important sectors for decarbonisation to get to net zero by 2050. So, I, you know, it's, it's completely understandable that that's been the focus of the discussions. Um, but I, I would like to flag that we are, um, we've worked with all the sectors and so we have um, manufacturing, food and agri, agriculture, um, we've started to develop um, a forestry, a sustainable forestry uh, strategy, um, we, we work with, uh, I mean I think, you know, Srini will know in particular a lot of clean tech companies, uh, that working across different sectors, uh, you know, a whole range of different uh, sectors that the strategy encompasses. Um, we're also starting to engage with financial institutions to help uh, local financial institutions uh, invest more in the climate related um, uh, investments that are going to be needed uh, to, to ensure that you have a strong uh, domestic financial uh, sector that can really help uh, and be, you know, be essential really in the transition to net zero. Um, so just wanted to flag that because um, I do feel we've focused very heavily on energy, which is probably not surprising, um, but I just wanted to, you know, sort of make that clear. And actually, if people look at the strategy, which is on our website, um, you can see there is, we have set out uh, some of the implications by different sectors, both in terms of how we may address physical impacts of climate change, as well as thinking about the sort of decarbonisation and how we can help to move those different sectors to net zero. Emily, you've taken us very nicely on to what I think will be our final question, and I'm going to put it to Srini Nagarajan. Uh, a few questions have come in around agriculture. Hmm? Will any of your discussion on climate change include direct investment in agriculture, or what are you planning to do in this sector in India and the South Asia? Srini. Thank you, uh, Nisha. Agri food and agriculture is a very important sector. You know the rural population of the country and how many people it uh, it it's 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 it 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 only it only it only constitutes fifteen percent of your GDP, but though it employs a significant number of people. 
And with the ongoing COVID crisis, which is happening today, we expect that rural India is going to uplift urban India the way it's turning out today. Food and agriculture, we got, uh, I think it's got a lot of archaic policies, which the government has recently revived. It's going to give us a lot of impetus in terms of our ability. I think there are two objectives we have on our food, food and agriculture. Number one is to improve the realizations in the, in the hands of producers. We must understand farmers are producers and they're not traders. So if you want to make farmers a trader and improve, make sure that they realize more in their hands, we must be in a position to have an efficient market system in terms of supply chain. That's probably what CDC will work on. So the second objective is to, is, 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 is to reduce the cost of all services so that the, 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 the overall friction cost within the system is reduced as much as possible. And their technology will be a very valid and important way in which we, have, we should be able to do it. Through our venture capital funds, we are seeded a lot of investments as far as if agri tech is concerned, which we will be participating with them on a, on a case by case basis in the next round. So that will be a very big thing for us. And the third important aspect I just want to say here is that I think the contract farming will be a very big area where we will try and focus. So improving access to farmers, improving con you know, contract farming where there is much more determination in terms of the farmer's ability to realize a certain price, which he or she is able to, you know, uh, should, should realize actually. And third one is to remove the friction cost. In and so those, those are the three main objectives. And I think there is a wide amount of private sector investing, which has to come into the food and agri sector, which has not happened in South Asia as yet. Yes, and it sounds like CDC is beginning to develop plans around that at a very important time with this uh, COVID pandemic still raging around us. Thank you so much, Srini. I'm going to put the final question to Dami Lola, and I'm going to ask you to be brief. Can you leave us, please, with how you see the coming together of the SDG 13 agenda, climate action, the SDC, SD7 um, on sustainable energy for all and the most pressing thing of all which is the development of poor countries that's why after all why we're here Damilola well I think the key thing is not to have them mutually exclusive they all are part of the the same pot we have to think of developing people um, creating jobs making people's lives better as we, we develop energy solutions as well um, and I think we're, we're getting there I think there's a lot of mo a lot of more work and data which is what my organization focuses on and influencing governments through regulations but you know this is the time is the clock is ticking and we really really have these two critical years to plan before we have to get on and implement so I would just like to encourage organizations like CDC that investments are needed private sector is needed on, in all parts of, of the value chain. Thank you for ending our discussion, Damilola, on a note of urgency. Let's say a big thank you to Damilola Ogun Bi, to Komel Khalili from Zephyr Power in Pakistan, to Amali Amin, who runs CDC's Climate Action Project and, and Division, and Srini Nagarajan on the ground in Bangalore, responsible for South Asia for CDC. Thank you to all of you for your many questions, for making this a lively and, and inclusive event. Um, may I please invite you to join us again next Tuesday at the same time, 11 a.m. Uh, UK summer time for our next session, our final session in these review events, which is on decent work, creating good jobs and generating economic growth. Until then, from me, Nisha Pillay, goodbye. <laughs>